A very good afternoon to all our participants. We thank you for joining us on this special webinar on examining 10 building blocks of OECD's Pillar 1. Our speaker for today's session is Mr. Radha Kishan Rawal. Mr. Rawal is a partner with Deloitte and has more than 22 years of professional experience. He has advised several MNCs and domestic companies on a variety of tax issues. He plays a key role in the center of excellence of Deloitte. Center of Excellence is a team of tax professionals providing guidance to the tax practice on technical aspects. Furthermore, for the last three years, he has been releasing a book containing his analysis of the provisions of the Finance Act. The, books, the book on Finance Act 2020 was recently released. Particularly with reference to today's webinar, Mr. Rawal shall deal with all the 10 building blocks of Pillar 1 and will give the desired understanding of the proposed new regime with suitable case studies. Before I hand it over to our speaker for today's webinar, I would like to take the opportunity to apprise you all that in the last 10 minutes of the webinar, our speaker will host a dedicated question and answer session. For this, you may post your queries in the chat box, which is located on the bottom right of your screen. Also requesting all participants to kindly keep their videos on mute. With this, I now hand it over to Mr. Rao. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tanya, and good evening to all the participants. Uh, Tanya, thank you very much for the uh, you know good introduction. And now I shall start my presentation. So, uh, OECD Pillar One, you know, and the Digital Economy uh, Project has been going on for a reasonably long period of time. We saw a first report, uh, or rather final report uh, of uh, BEPS Section 1 in 2015. Thereafter in 2018, there was an interim order. Then in last October, November, you know, we saw a Pillar 1 coming up and Pillar 2 was also there. And thereafter, there has been a further progress. So our understanding from Pillar 1 in last October, November is something what you saw in the screen, is that they come up with a new solution to address the problem of digital economy and the profit allocation was to be done in, you know, uh, under three tier system. Amount A, that was a new taxing right. Essentially, it's a, it's a share of residual profit allocated to market countries on a formula basis. Amount B is a fixed return on baseline, uh, it's a fixed return on baseline marketing and uh, distribution function and thus provided on an arm's length basis. And amount C is something which, if some functions go beyond the baseline marketing and distribution function, then the profit which gets allocated is amount C. Now, if we see here, amount B and amount C are something which is, uh, you know, linked to transfer pricing, and amount A, which is a completely new taxing right, is not linked to transfer pricing, but is based on a, a formula approach. Uh, you know, obviously, we have been kind of you know playing with this uh, amount ABC for you know for about a year or so. But uh, uh, you know, what exactly the amount is and how exactly you know would the working happen? That's something you know there was not enough clarity. That's for the reason that the last draft which OECD released in October November, that was you know a, a very small document running into about uh, 15 20 pages, and it had a lot of concepts within it. Now what has happened is that OECD has worked a lot on it, okay? The new draft is something which they are going to discuss in the inclusive framework in the months to come. And if that has to happen, if this amount ABC mechanism has to come in, then that's going to completely change the manner in which the MNCs are taxed, you know, uh, are going to be taxed in the future. So if this is to happen, you know, three years, four years, five years down the line, the international taxation would look completely different. And that's for the reason, you know, why it's not appropriate, but we have to study this uh, new concepts, new international developments at this stage as well. As I said earlier, this is still a WIP, you know, a lot more improvement could still be happen. On the top of it, there has to be a political consensus uh, uh, to this entire thing. And again, you know, everything will depend on what approach the US takes on the entire thing. Nonetheless, uh, from as compared to what we were about a year back, a lot more has happened, a lot more clarity has come in. And that's why you know, it's not appropriate to discuss this at this point of time. Uh, let's understand you know, how does this amount work. So this bar on the screen you know, is coming from one of the OECD presentations. They've divided a total uh, profit into two parts, routine profits and non-routine profits. A part of non-routine profits, which is X percentage, 
is at, treated as amount A, and that amount is something which will be allocated to the market jurisdictions. Let's understand these amounts in little more detail. Uh, this is something you know which is not very clearly coming out uh, from the uh, from the report, but you know one has to derive it uh, because all these questions you know will keep on to our mind as to what is the correlation between these amounts and how do we tally these amounts. So very briefly, profit before tax can be divided in two parts: residual profits and routine profits. Profit before tax can also be divided you know in looked at it differently, which is amount A, amount B, and amount C. Amount A is x percentage of residual profit and a substantial part of pillar one is all around uh, this uh, amount a so that's why it's very important to understand this concept and this x percentage of uh, residual profit is something which is distributed among the market jurisdiction what is routine profit routine profit again can be divided into two parts one is amount b which is essentially a fixed return on a baseline marketing and distribution activities and routine profits on other functions. Now, depending on the facts, you know, and circumstances of the case, a market jurisdiction can get either of this. It can get amount A, amount B, and amount C, all three amounts. It can get amount A and amount B, or it can get A and C, or it can get B and C, it can get B, or it can get C. Wherever there's a question mark, you know, I mean, there's a doubt whether this will actually happen or not, but it will all depend on the facts of the case. And again, to reiterate, Amount A is something which is a departure from transfer pricing, which is based on a formula and how the formula works and is explained in the subsequent slides. And amount B and C continues to be based on the transfer pricing and arms length pricing. So, you know, why it's, you know, why this is you know, much bigger issue and uh, why it's taking so much of time to uh, uh, you know, get a political consensus on it. As we know, in the inclusion framework, there are 138 countries working. And the major issue is one is the, the entire mechanism is far more complicated. And second is that after doing all this, a very little money, you know, very little tax revenue is going to flow to the real market jurisdictions. So keeping all 138 countries together, getting the consensus on, you know, to, on all the issues and considering the fact that you know, after doing you know, so much of complicated working, what they are going to get is not a significantly you know, major amount. That's, you know, that's a real challenge. Now, uh, you know, all that I can correlate is a picture like this, okay, where, in, you know, which somehow comes in our WhatsApp messages every three months, six months, and we have a question as to which one gets filled up first. And here in the context of pillar one, the question is how much ultimately will flow to the market jurisdictions. So, you know, this is one of the, the biggest uh, 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 kind of a criticism of this pillar one is that <clears throat> after doing such a complicated exercise, the market countries are going to get a very little amount. Uh, now this pillar one, okay, it's, 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 it's much more detailed uh, as compared to what we had earlier. And there are number of you know, new concepts and new definitions or you know, new phrases which are getting utilized. I thought, you know, it would be good to kind of you know, show to you the, the new concepts you know, and new words which are getting utilized to have a complete grip, you know, over this one has to have a very good understanding of all of this. And if I have to explain on the basis of these definitions, okay, probably it, it may take, uh, uh, you know, two or three days, uh, you know, to complete the entire thing. So instead of, going, as against doing that, what I'm doing is that I'm directly starting with a, with a formula. So, you know, which is like uh, showing a climax of the movie first and then going to flashback and looking to each aspect separately. So let's jump to the formula, how it's going to work. So here, this is a case study kind of thing, and this case study is something which is explained by OECD. Uh, group A, okay, one of the important things which is happening is that when we talk about pillar A, uh, uh, pillar one, that is also a departure from single entity taxation. The profits gets taxed, the profits gets calculated and it gets taxed on at a group level, not on an individual uh, entity level. So this is something which is completely you know, new to us some of the countries, some of the Western countries have a concept of group taxation, but as far as India is concerned, you know, we never had a concept of group taxation. We treat each and every entity as a separate legal entity and tax is levied on this entity separately. But here in pillar one, the tax is calculated, the profits are calculated at a group level and then allocation happens. So here's a case where group A is a large m &E 
and is providing uh, you know exclusive ads uh, automated digital services by, via online platform uh, it has presence in three countries market 1 market 2 and market 3 in market 1 it has a local subsidiary in market 2 there is a remote activity in market 3 there is a remote activity so in market 2 and 3 the entity does not have any presence does not have any permanent establishment if there is a local subsidiary the source country gets a taxing right if there is a p in the country the source country gets a taxing right but if there is no p no, no local subsidiary then the, the activity is treated as a remote activity and under the current uh, you know law of tax treaties uh, you know there is no adequate taxing right which is coming on this so this is the the you know the entity structure uh, when we look at the the total revenue of the group which is uh, 25000 euro million profit before tax is 6500 and profit margin is 26% how does the formula work okay and that's that's i said that we are directly getting into the climax to understand how it's going to work and then we are going to look at each of the building blocks separately so first thing to do step 1 is to determine groups residual profits okay to understand that this is the groups residual profit this is not individual entities uh, residual profit and how is that residual profit determined is determined by profit before tax you know reduced by x percentage of profit margin so in this case the the profit before tax for the entity is uh, 6500 and if we take 10% as a as a profitability ratio we get a residual profit of 4000 step 2 is to determine reallocation percentage or allocable tax base so as i said earlier uh, you know a fixed percentage of residual profits gets distributed amongst the market jurisdiction uh, in this case the ratio is taken at 20% so 20% of 4000 which comes to 800 that's something which is to be distributed as allocable uh, uh, tax base to various market jurisdictions the question is where does this 10% come from okay now 10% is something which is to be agreed upon as a you know as a fixed percentage by the inclusive framework uh, uh, members now the question is where does the 20% come from that 20% is also to be agreed upon by the inclusive framework members so these are the two percentages you know which will be agreed upon by by the by the group members and this is something which is termed as a simplifying convention now if you know if someone has read the 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 reports which came out in october and november last year uh, you know one of the confusing term you know was simplifying convention and for few months you know i always kept on wondering you know what does the simplifying convention mean but now uh, you know it's becoming clear the simplifying convention is nothing but you know kind of a a, a presumed thing you know or or a shortcut or something which you know which would otherwise require a detailed working is is derived in a you know in a in a in a presumption manner so these are the two simplifying conventions which are taken up in this example which is 10% and 20% respectively and this is something which is to be kind of finalized by the inclusive member inclusive framework members now the next step is to distribute the amount of 800 which is amount a among the market jurisdiction this distribution happens in the ratio of local revenues So if the earlier slide showed that the revenues earned by market one, market two, and market three is two thousand, eighteen thousand, and five thousand. The amount of eight hundred gets distributed in this proportion amongst the three markets. Uh, now here, if you go back, the, um, uh, market one already has a subsidiary, okay, but still this subsidiary also gets an additional eight, uh, uh, location of sixty-four thousand because that country has also contributed. okay so this is uh, you know a, a broader understanding of the formula uh, 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 you know which uh, which oecd has come up with there are various parts of it you know to arrive at this a lot of reworking is required a lot of the new concepts are introduced and it's as good as you know a kind of you know rewriting tax laws you know for several countries and that's what uh, you know oecd is doing here so what are the 10 blocks the 10 blocks are scope nexus revenue sourcing tax base determination profit allocation elimination of double taxation amount b again the scope and quantum of amount b and then tax certainty and below that all what you need is a mechanism for implementation and administration 
so there's a lot of guidance uh, you know which oecd has prepared oecd inclusive framework has prepared uh, on each of this and you know we will will kind of uh, get a very broader understanding of this in the next slides so uh, let's quickly move on to amount a which is the scope so what was the entire project was for the entire project was for taxation of digital economy okay that's why all it started so in this amount a uh, they are looking at two categories of activities one is automated digital services and second is consumer facing business now consumer facing business is something which is not necessarily uh, in the in the you know uh, digital uh, in nature but digital or the advanced technology does have an influence on that business as well that's why uh, you know the framework has thought it appropriate to include the consumer facing business as well we're going to understand you know both of this in little more detail uh, automated uh, digital services is basically uh, you know a service uh, which is which is kind of delivered automatically okay defining this term uh, could be complex defining this term you know this term could lead to a lot of litigation and defining this term could also be difficult for the reason that the technology will keep on improving and the new kind of services the new business models will keep on emerging you know as we move forward so how is this issue addressed what they have done is that they have created a positive list they have created a negative list and then there is a general definition so to determine whether something is a is a ads or automated digital services or not first one has to check does it fall in a positive list the answer is yes there is no need to look at uh, the general definition the second question does it fall in a negative list if the answer is yes again there is no need to look at the general definition only if the services do not fall in either of these two then one has an opportunity or one has to necessarily look at the definition of uh, one has to look at the general definition and try to determine whether that is ads or not now the sentence at the bottom you know is kind of a, a, a underlying state, a statement you know which is the purpose uh, which is to be achieved and the, and every time we want to understand this concept you know, we have to necessarily keep on reading this sentence and then we understand now for what reason they are doing so the sentence is what is the purpose of this entire project the purpose is to target those many groups that are able to participate in an active and sustained manner in the economic life of a market jurisdiction without having commensurate level of taxable presence so this is something which they want to do this was something which they want to achieve and for that reason they have defined all these terms so let's look at uh, the definition in little more detail so as i said there's a positive list and there's a negative list this positive and negative list is something which is expandable so in the future if new kind of services emerge new kind of business models emerge they can go on adding the list what is the general definition general definition essentially means uh, you know a service which is automated uh, in nature which is uh, you know which is uh, based on a uh, utilization of uh, uh, machines uh, it's over the internet or electronic work what is the most important part of it it's something which is having a minimum human involvement so services you know should be of such nature that it has a minimum human involvement to qualify that service as uh, uh, as an automated digital services now if you remember clearly uh, you know we have uh, a lot of dispute on what quantify what qualifies as a fee fees for technical services and our supreme court you know several years back you know brought in this parameter of human involvement and they said that human involvement is necessary to qualify something as a fee for technical services uh after so many years you know when the oecd is looking at it you know they also tried to rely on something similar they looked at uh, uh, you know they said that uh, ads is something which would require a minimum human involvement there's a further guidance uh, on what is minimum human involvement uh, undoubtedly uh, you know for setting up any system you know you require human involvement but after once the system is set up you know one you can keep on expanding it to a you know, number of users you know uh, 
without proportionate increase in the cost or without proportionate increase in the human involvement that something is called as a human involvement so basically the you know the concept of uh, you know scale without mass you know i mean these are the terms they have used uh, since 2015 that's something which can be achieved through this uh, automated system and that's where this is to be applied so what are the positive risks i, I mean some of us sort of you know or we are familiar with the services online advertising services uh, uh, sale or, or other alienation of user data online search engines you know social media platform online intermediation platforms uh, uh, you know digital content services online gaming and so on so uh, some of the business models are already identified some of the business models are uh, put in the negative list now let's go to a next concept which is a consumer facing business what is a consumer facing business uh, they they have given a definition of a consumer facing business it's a, it's a, it's a business that generates revenue from sale of goods or services or of a type common of a type commonly sold to consumers including those selling indirectly through intermediaries or by way of franchising and licensing it's a very very uh, well defined you know a very carefully drafted definition and then the further guidance on some of the terms which are utilized in in the definition who is the consumer consumer is essentially an individual okay individual means it's a it's, it's a it's a natural person and ultimately uh, uh, you know he is the one or he or she is the one who is going to consume the service so is you know there's a concept of consumer is very important the consumer would typically utilize the goods or services for his personal purpose and not for commercial or professional purposes uh, as against that there's also a definition of user so they have distinguished between consumer and user and something which uh, you know uh, which it does not qualify as a consumer uh, you know may get into a user category a user could be a individual or a business house or an entity so what is important is that services should be something which is ultimately goods or services something which is uh, you know consumed by individual so you, you know you can think of all the goods or services you know which which we as an individual you know uh, utilize we consume and then you can you know think whether this is falling within definition of cfp or not again the next important term is offer type commonly sold to consumer so goods those goods or those services which are uh, you know which are of a nature or of a type which is commonly sold to consumer a consumer would typically buy goods you know uh, uh, for a personal consumption he would buy it you know the, the such goods would be available in a retail market as against you know something which is available in a wholesale market there's a guidance on sold to sold to is again treated in an inclusive uh, uh, manner it includes sale lease license so it's not only over the counter sale but includes the concept of lease as well it includes the concept of license as well it includes the rent as well uh, now typically for any goods or services there could be a supply chain there could be a manufacturer there could be you know a, a retailer there could be wholesaler you know and there are number of other intermediaries in between they are not targeting all of them they are targeting only those uh, 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 you know entities which are facing the consumer so an intermediary you know would typically not face a consumer but the uh, the, the the threshold or the parameter is you know what does the consumer look at if i buy a branded product i look at the brand so a brand in that sense is a consumer facing and then when i buy a product i go to a retail shop so that retailer is also included as a uh, uh, as a consumer facing so the concept of you know facing consumer you know is very important in this cfp uh, there's a good amount of uh, uh, you know guidance uh, which is uh, available uh maybe i covered this slide so i'll not uh, get into this but what is important here is a uh, uh, consumer facing business uh, you know person is included provided that person is having a direct uh, you know contractual relationship with the customer so consumer uh, uh, consumer uh, i mean the, the 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 retailer would typically have a direct contractual relationship with the consumer that's why the retailer would get included a uh, wholesaler you know would not have a manufacturer you know would typically not have third party intermediaries you know manufacturer wholesaler the distributors also you know would not necessarily have a relationship with the consumer so they are excluded there's a good amount of guidance available on certain sectors 
such as uh, uh, pharmaceutical you know so within pharmaceutical they are looking at uh, medicines and medical devices so if you look at medical devices you know a person may go for x ray or person may go for mri or go for such scan but that's something which is not uh, you know directly consumed by them it's you know it's it's rooted through hospital you know or or, or a pathology kind of a thing so a medical device would typically not be treated as a cfd but the medication consumers individually you know eat the medicines that's why the medication is included again within medication you know they're looking at different approaches there are some medicines which are available over the counter some of them are prescribed drugs and some of them are given by the the doctors when a patient is admitted in the hospital so they are trying to you know look at uh, this level of uh, analysis to determine whether something is qualifying as a as a cfp or not the business uh, uh, the franchising there are two parts you know business format franchising uh, you know wherein you have uh, hotels or restaurants you know you go to starbucks starbucks in in you know in india or uk or america all across you know would have a similar standard a lot of these businesses are run in the form of franchisee so in india starbucks may have been run by you know someone else but starbucks uh, the you know the the parent entity uh, you know that business would be treated as a cfb because in that sense they are facing the branch similarly a lot of the hotels hotel uh, you know chains which you see they also have a similar function uh, similarly licensing you know a bit of music uh, cartoons logo that is also treated as a uh, you know as a as a consumer facing business because what consumer recognizes is the you know is the logo uh, or what consumer recognizes is kind of a music Uh, so that licensing business also gets uh, also gets covered they have identified certain dual usage products you know uh, let's say uh, a, a motor car it can be bought by an individual for, for his personal use or it can be bought by a business you know uh, for commercial use as well now this kind of products you know which are having uh, you know a dual use is are treated as in scope uh, uh, goods so they are treated as a cfp but if the if the goods is something which is an intermediary product let's say you know a tire of a car you know if 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 uh, <clears throat> if, a, if if a, if if owner of the car uh, you know if his tire break down you know he he can go to a tire shop and buy a tire to replace uh, in his car so in in some cases you know he may be purchasing the tire but most of the cases uh, you know that's not the business model because a tire is essentially an intermediary product so this kind of intermediary products are not to be included and then there are specific exclusions they have taken out uh, natural resources financial services construction uh, sector and international airlines and shipping businesses are out of this so they are not to be treated as consumer facing business that's you know that's kind of a, a, a given position so one need not necessarily look at it uh, so essentially uh, you know you know with this kind of a background you know it becomes very interesting for us to you know to just keep on uh, checking on everything which we consume as individual you know which we use as individual and try to determine whether that's a consumer facing business or not now <clears throat> having understood you know the the threshold uh, the the in scope of ads and cfp now it's not uh, you know all the mne groups you know which will quantify there is a concept of threshold uh, so there are two thresholds they have given one is global revenue threshold so if the consolidated group revenue of the entity is more than 750 million euro that entity is treated as uh, in scope so the entire exercise of amount allocation is applicable to that entity provided it also satisfies the second threshold the second threshold is de minimis for an input services so it's not uh, it's not uh, you know sufficient that the entity has a as a global revenue of 150 million it should also have a, a global in scope uh, uh, revenue from foreign countries of 250 million that's a minimum so what they are trying to do is that uh, you know they are trying to keep the smaller entities uh, out of it smaller uh, uh, mne groups uh, out of it and the reason for that is given is that the cost of compliance you know of the new mechanism is far more complex so to maintain a balance between you know revenue threshold and the cost of compliance 
this kind of uh, 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 i mean the balance between the the new taxes which could be collected and the cost of collecting those taxes this kind of thresholds are considered uh, certainly these are at uh, you know discussion stage uh, what happens is that when this kind of thresholds are taken a lot of the entities a uh, lot of the many groups uh, you know who otherwise could be uh, could be providing ads or uh, cfp businesses would be out of it you know so that's something which is getting closely discussed so uh, uh, you know having understood uh, the the scope you know what is the the nature of services uh, they are trying to cover let's look at the nexus now the scope is something which was looked at the service provider or at a seller level so m any group uh, you know whether m any group is required to do amount of allocation is determined by the scope whereas nexus is something which is looked at from a jurisdiction perspective whether a country you know should get an amount of allocation or not that's determined on a nexus basis so what is nexus in in very simple terms you know if we look at the tax treaty uh, mechanism the very basic thing which comes to our mind is a concept of permanent establishment if a foreign company has a p in india india gets a taxing right so p is a nexus uh, in that sense uh, in the context of uh, uh, digital economy what is a nexus they have you know kind of considered a, a few items and few iterations they come to a conclusion that nexus should primarily be a financial uh, a concept so uh, they came up with a two thresholds for ads automated digital services where uh, where the mne has a sale of more than you know uh, 1 million in a year from a jurisdiction it's uh, it's believed that that jurisdiction has a sufficient nexus to be entitled to amount of allocation for cfb it's it's believed that cfb you know it's 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 little difficult uh, you know is uh, as compared to uh, ads to earn revenue easily so they have adopted a higher threshold a higher threshold of 3 million uh, euro plus a plus factor you know additionally a plus factor so the the way it works is that a uh, minimum 3 uh, million revenue in a year plus additionally a concept of fixed establishment or a fixed place of business uh, in a jurisdiction in a country if that combination is satisfied then that country has a has a right to tax or if a if a revenue itself is more than uh, let's say 15 million in that case that country also gets a a right to uh, levy tax uh, the lot of discussion uh, which is happening on the lower threshold for the lower economies so again to explain how is going to work is that if an mne group is earning revenue from ads less than 1 million from a country then that country does not get a taxing right to levy tax on that money so if a revenue is let's say you know 0.9 million then there is no taxing right you know with the country gets and and that's why uh, you know some of the smaller economies you know are going to get hurt because of this and they would raise uh, you know concern that you no know, there should be a higher threshold and from that perspective there would be a for for the work and they would determine how to get into it again it's very important to understand what is the concept of nexus and what is they are trying to achieve so in this context it's understood that if an entity is earning Euro one million from ADS, that is a sufficient indicator of an active and sustained participation in the economic life of a country, and for that reason, that country should be given a taxing right. I refer to a concept of plus factor, and that plus factor is essentially a local entity or a, you know a presence in the form of a P. So what is contemplated is that they would come up with a new concept of P, you know, for the purpose of this uh, nexus. and which would contain only the common feature between the oecd and the un model that means you know there would not be an agency p that would not be a service p okay but only a kind of a fixed base p now let's you know uh, try to understand uh, on the basis of an example you know so that you can relate uh, what i'm saying it doesn't become too theoretical so let's say uh, this is an mne group which has a presence in 20 countries okay uh, the accounts are consolidated consolidated at c3 level which is a country 3 which is called ultimate parent entity upe 
and uh, you know i have given some numbers so in country 2 uh, the revenue from ads is 2 million which is above the threshold the revenue from uh, in country 4 the revenue from ads is 0 0.5 million which is below the threshold a revenue from CFD is zero two million, which is also below the threshold. So similarly, you know, for uh, uh, C six, C fifteen, C sixteen, C eighteen, I have given the, the the indicators, and based on this, wherever the threshold is met, that country will get a taxing right, you know, over amount A. So in this case, C two, C six, C fifteen, C sixteen would get allocation of amount A, whereas C four and C18 will not get an allocation from amount A. So this is how you know this is this concept uh, uh, you know is 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 going to work. Uh, this diagram you know basically makes it easier to understand how this will work. Now having understood uh, the nexus, you know let's get to the next concept which is uh, revenue sourcing rules. So what we said earlier is that uh, if a revenue of uh, one million is derived from a particular country, that country gets a taxing right. But what is the parameter, you know, on what basis one comes to a conclusion that a revenue of 1 million is derived from that country. And for that matter, they have made something called as a sourcing principles. The sourcing principle uh, is essentially a principle, you know, which helps uh, to determine a country from which the revenue is coming to continue the sales are made. So what they've done is that, uh, you know, they have kind of, uh, uh, thought through all the business models which are currently prevalent and they have given indicators, they have given sourcing principles and they have been indicators. And these indicators are supposed to be, uh, you know, applied in a particular hierarchy one after another. Uh, so what it means is that uh, they're supposed to be applied in a chronological manner. Only if the first indicator or information for the first indicator is not available, one is supposed to go for the second one. So there's a concept of unavailable or unreliable. So it may happen that information is not available, so it's not possible to apply that threshold, apply that indicator, or even if the information is available, it's not possible to uh, you know, you know, rely on that information. So it's not reliable, then you move on to the next indicator. Uh, let's understand how it works. As I said, they, they were thought through all the EDS businesses, and they were thought through all the kind of revenues you know, which could be generated from this EDS businesses. So this is something which they, they, they worked upon. Uh, you will see there's a lot of uh, you know, repetition in the sense that income from online advertisement, you know, appears in almost all the business models. But that's how you know the business is, is functioning. Now, uh, you know, this this slide is something you know, which gives a, you know, a far far better understanding how this is going to work out. So, uh, for online advertising services based on real time location of viewers, so they they uh, they, they looked at two business models based on real time location of viewers and which is not based on real-time location of viewers. What is the sourcing rule for this? Sourcing rule is the jurisdiction of real-time location of the viewer of the advertisement. So the, the country in which the location of the viewer is, that country you know, is treated as a country from which the revenue is emerging. And what are the indicators for that? There are three indicators, A, B, C, uh, the jurisdiction, of the geological uh, geolocation of the device of the viewer. So viewer will use a typical device to look at the advertisement and the geolocation of that device in whichever country, that country gets a tax right? That country is treated as a country from which the revenue is emerging. If such information is not available or if such information is not reliable, then one has to go to the next uh, indicator, which is the jurisdiction of the IP address of the device of the viewer. Okay, so if the first one fails, if the first one is not good enough, then you go to the next one. If the next one also does not work, then you go to the third one. So this is the manner in which, you know, one is supposed to determine the country, uh, you know, from which the revenue is emerging. So, uh, you know, for all these business models, you know, there's a guidance given, there's, you know, there's a, there are indicators, uh, you know, given for all this. To understand and come to a conclusion as to what is the country from which the revenue is emerging. Similarly, for consumer-facing goods, uh, you know, similar in a similar manner, uh, the guidance is given for a consumer-facing goods which is directly sold to a customer. The sourcing rule is the jurisdiction of a place of final delivery of the goods. The relevant factors or relevant indicators are the jurisdiction 
of the retail uh, sales store or sale uh, storefront directly selling the customer so the, the store which is selling the, the customer is the one which is uh, you know is that's a location or the jurisdiction of the final delivery of the uh, delivery address of the goods and that's uh, that's the that's a place uh, from which uh, the revenue is emerging. Now, uh, if some of you, you know, are familiar with the, you know, with the GST law, uh, you know, you may find a lot of these things you know, broadly comparable to, uh, you know, the place of supply rules, you know, the location of the supplier, uh, uh, you know, rules. So there's some parallel which can be drawn, but this is going to work on a standard on basis. Uh, <clears throat> Now the entity uh, who is going to apply the sourcing rule. Okay, the sourcing rule is to be applied by the ME itself. So the group, the group company has to you know determine uh, how this sourcing rule work, and they have to come to a conclusion that if, if they earn a revenue of let's say two million uh, 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 euros, then from which countries this amount is emerging. Uh, for that reason, they need to have you know a, a very good IT system to you know to to uh, dig out this information. There has to be good number of uh, uh, you know internal control uh, framework for this. This information, uh, when the M&E collects the information, uh, one is also supposed to you know uh, uh, kind of justify as, a, as to why a particular indicator was not used and why a next one was you know, followed in the hierarchy. So they have an obligation to do all this. Again, uh, it says that when the, when the entity maintains the data, uh, they have to maintain data considering the privacy norms uh, to be followed because a lot of new, new rules are coming up for the privacy norms. So they have an obligation. Uh, the data would not be available for a very long period of time. Uh, uh, you know, so the the data is to be maintained in a in a particular manner. You know, for a for a certain period of time. But it, it you know it may not work like a normal tax assessment that even after you know 12 years or 15 years, assessing office is going to ask the data. The data would be reviewed. Uh, you know, could be reviewed at some point of time. You know, by the tax administrations, and it could be you know a representative panel who is going to look at it. So, but the, the work of the panel would be more of an, uh, you know, IT audit. So rather than looking at a transaction level data, they will look at the data on a broader basis. So now, uh, you know, having uh, understood uh, the, uh, the sourcing rule, next issue is the tax based determination. And uh, this is essentially to determine is that on what amount of uh, profit you know the ratios are to be applied what is the amount of profit which is to be distributed so uh, the profit distributable profits uh, you know is to be determined on the basis of profit before tax so one has to look at the consolidated uh, accounts consolidated financial statements of the entity and then derive you know what is the the profit uh, before tax of the group uh, you know the the profits need to be prepared in accordance with uh, you know well recognized uh, uh, gaps the accounting standards and they said that accounting standards of uh, us japan china canada india korea singapore these are the ones which are kind of uh, uh, recognized basically these are on the lines of uh, uh, ifrs uh, and then uh, there are only a minimum level of book to tax adjustments you know which be, which would be done to this uh, profit before tax and these are uh, essentially uh, for income tax expenses, uh, you know, for dividend income and uh, you know gain or loss from from shares, uh, uh, <clears throat> and inclusion of exclusion of income uh, for you know which is derived as per the equity method of accounting. So essentially, where the stakes equity stakes are below fifty percent, the consolidation doesn't happen. That kind of profit is not to be included. And then again, there are certain expenses which are not deductible on a public policy reasons. They also are to be excluded. So there are very minimum basic adjustments to be done to the accounts, uh, you know, the profits which are shown by the by the consolidated accounts. Uh, <clears throat> now, the numbers could be determined on two bases. One is they could be as per the the consolidated account of the, the entire group, or they are contemplating that the group may have maintained accounts as per the segmental basis. Uh, so they the companies do have a segmented basis of accounting okay so the profit and loss account or the balance sheet you know would indicate uh, the segmental uh, profits so the ratios uh, you know the profits could also be considered as per the segmental uh, basis uh, segmental uh, reports 
now uh, they have recognized that all the companies may not be preparing it preparing you know accounts as per a segmented basis may be complicated uh, uh, you know to do for everyone so they are starting you know with a with a uh, you know with again another threshold they are saying that the global revenue is lesser than 20 20 billion uh, uh, euro then there's a segmental exemption available for those entities you look at the, the consolidated uh, financial statement if that exemption is not available then one has to uh, you know look at that whether the entity already has some sort of uh, uh, segmental accounts prepared if they are already prepared you know then one could adopt there uh, and then at the end of it you know what they are contemplating is that there could be very few entities very few mnes uh, you know who would have an obligation to prepare financial statements as per the as per the segmental accounts only because of uh, uh, for the purpose of account day, amount day. so uh, you know this uh, this is to do with the 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 book profits okay the the profit uh, the ratio of 10% and 20% which we discussed earlier that is to be applied in the context of book profit okay you need to have a tax base from which you determine a distributable surplus so you start with with the book profits uh, the, the, uh, there is a finding on the the losses they are saying that uh, when profits are to be distributed uh, when when the entities you know gets a right to tax uh, when the countries get a right to tax profit they also have to uh, you know ensure that the losses are compensated for however the losses are not to be distributed uh, you know to the respective jurisdictions the losses would be kept in a in a in a, in a pool account and then it could be adjusted against the subsequent years uh, you know, profit so uh, you know it may happen that that, that an entity mne is deriving profits from let's say you know eight jurisdictions deriving deriving revenue from eight jurisdiction in a particular year the entity makes losses so the amount of loss let's say which is you know uh, 50 billion that 50 million need not be divided between those eight jurisdictions in the year in which losses are made but to be to be carried forward in a separate pool and to be distributed in a to be adjusted against the subsequent years uh, taxable profits so uh, you know they i mean they have kind of uh, gone through you know this much uh, layer of detailing on the profit uh, uh, determination and then the the next one is you know profit allocation now this is you know the same thing which we we, we looked at earlier the three steps of uh, uh, determining profit First, you apply profitability threshold to arrive at a residual profit. Then, you, you derive at a, at a fraction of a residual profit, which is to be distributed amongst the market jurisdictions. And then you allocate the jurisdiction, uh, allocate the distributed profits on the basis of the ratio of the turnover in the respective countries. So, I'll not uh, go through this slide. This is the same slide which we discussed earlier. Uh, I just deal with one of the complications, you know, which they have highlighted. Which is the issue of uh, <clears throat> of double counting? So what they are contemplating is that uh, the the amount A, okay, and we can discuss this on the basis of this example. So in this case, the entity has a presence in in eight countries. Uh, country C is is a is a UPE, and uh, amount A allocations happens in uh, country C1, C3, C7, C4, C6, and C8. Now out of this. C4, uh, C6, and C8. There is already an existing presence there. So C4 and C6 are branches, and C8 has. So what is contemplated is that uh, in these jurisdictions, because of this existing presence, the country already have a taxing right under the existing uh, mechanism. So how is going to work is that. The existing taxing right, as per the domestic law and as per the tax treaty, continue to work as they are. Amount A allocation is on the top of it, so that's worked out separately. So it's possible that in these countries, C4, C6, and C8, there is a double counting, and this double counting, you know, needs to be addressed. So they have come up with a, a mechanism, you know, to uh, to reduce uh, this double counting. Which could be on the basis of a threshold, or it could be a method of double uh, elimination of double taxation, or a domestic law exemption.
Okay, so now let's look at the elimination of double taxation. So what we saw is that, uh, you know, how is the profit distributed among this country? And then the next stage is the profit of, uh, you know, elimination of double taxation. So in this example, uh, UP is, uh, is A. So country A is a, is a country, you know, is, is a place where the ultimate uh, parent entity is uh, situated. And the market jurisdictions are D, E, and F. And the profits are booked in jurisdiction A, B, and C. So what happens is that the, the profits in this example are situated in location B, country B. And the allocation happens to DEF, which is 100, 150, and 150. What it means is that B Limited, uh, which is in country B, has an obligation to pay taxes in country B, E, and F. So the, the, the B Limited has to pay tax on 800 in, in country B as well, as well as it has to pay tax in country D, E, and F. So B has to eliminate double taxation and that double taxation you know, could elimination could happen through a credit method or through uh, exemption method, you know, the same methods which we have seen in the tax treaties. So this is, you know, you know I mean, this is basically a kind of explains, uh, you know, a, a next part of it after determination of profit, after distribution of profit, there is an obligation to determine the paying entity in this case, which is a B, B limited, and that B limited has an obligation to pay tax in B, E, and F. And then similarly, because there's a double taxation, which is faced by B limited, B limited, the, the jurisdiction B, country B, you should, you know, uh, relieve that double taxation. Now let's go on to the, to the next one, which is the amount B. Amount B, uh, you know, is not, is not far more complex. It is uh, kind of a continuation of the existing transfer pricing with the only difference is that uh, they are giving a fixed return to the baseline marketing and distribution function. So the baseline marketing and distribution function is very strictly determined, is very strictly defined. And for that uh, marketing and distribution functions, there's a fixed return, you know, which is to be given. The, the objective which is achieved by this is that a lot of the disputes which could be happening currently as regards returns to this based in marketing and distribution function would be eliminated and you know there would be simplicity and also there would be tax certainty so there's a lot more guidance on the you know how is this baseline uh, marketing distribution functions are to be identified uh, mostly they have placed a lot of reliance on the existing transfer pricing uh, uh, provisions so uh, you know it's not uh, it's not a significantly new concept uh, in that sense uh, except that you know the returns uh, would be standardized, you know, so that the the, the the chances of disputes would go down. Now the question is, you know, how the entire thing is going to get implemented. So they have thought of uh, you know tax certainty process, and there is also a concept of assessment. So as we saw that the entire profit amounts gets calculated in the UP, which is ultimate uh, uh, parent entity. The, that entity also has an obligation to uh, determine in which countries the profits are to be allocated. So the, prof the, the, the top entity, you know, the ultimate parent entity would, uh, is, has an obligation to do the entire working. Okay, they have to find out, you know, what is the, they have to apply the revenue sourcing rule, you know, they have to determine profit allocation, they have to, uh, you know, apply those uh, 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 ratios of 10% and 20%, you know, as may be agreed upon. And then they also have an obligation to quantify how much profit is to be given, how much profit, how much tax is to be paid in the market jurisdictions. So the entire process, the entire, you know, uh, uh, distribution, entire, uh, uh, you know, interaction with the tax authorities happen in the, the top entity as against, uh, you know, in the respective countries. So uh, in the initial years, you know, they have contemplated something called early certainty process because these are a lot of new concepts. 
uh, okay, it's going to work like, uh, you know, not exactly like an advanced ruling, but you know, the entities, the MNE school go upfront and ask for clarification. So they would come up with their, uh, you know, own understanding and they would submit it to the lead text jurisdictions. So let's look at, uh, you know, some of the concepts. Uh, there's a concept of lead text, lead text jurisdiction. So if it is a, a US based entity, then the US becomes the lead text jurisdiction. Now, uh, it, it, you know, the lead text jurisdiction has a specific uh, role to play, but as a result of this working, uh, you know, the several text jurisdictions across the world get impacted. So let's say a US m &E is earning income from uh, 10 countries, okay? And the profits are allocated based on, uh, you know, the formula to 10 countries. The question is, you know, would the assessment happen in all 10 countries? The answer is no. The assessment would happen at a group level. That's why there's a concept of a review panel. Okay, so in the certainty process, the entire documentation uh, would be submitted to the review panel and the review panel will you know do a sort of assessment or an audit of the workings done by the by the entity and come to a conclusion whether the work done by them is accurate as per the as per the agreed rules or no uh, who will be then the review panel the review panel is contemplated to be consisting of uh, maybe seven to eight or six to eight uh, 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 six to eight officers from different tax uh, administrations uh, they have to be a representative so they would take a representative from the from the developing countries small economies you know medium economies in developing or developed countries as well so the, this group of officers which would come from different countries you know which would represent uh, different uh, economies they are the ones you know who are going to uh, you know kind of uh, certify you know or or, or do an assessment of uh, the work which is done by the many now it may happen that you know uh, the <coughs> the us company may be earning income from let's say 30 countries okay now the tax officers of all 30 countries would never get a chance to do this assessment okay they would uh, they would only be a representative who will be there in the review panel you know who would look at this uh, you know as a part of the tax certainty process so uh, does it mean that you know all the 30 tax officers of 30 countries would never have any say in that again the answer is no uh, this 30 countries these 30 jurisdictions you know would be termed as affected tax administrations so at some point of time, you know, they would have the ability to review it. So first it is, you know, looked at by the tax administration, lead tax administration, okay, which is essentially the country in which you're, uh, with the ultimate parent company, parent entity uh, is submitting the documents, submitting the returns and the documents. And then it goes to the review panel, uh, you know, if there's a request for early certainty, if there's no such request, it directly goes to the tax affected uh, administrations. The tax affected administrations, you know, always object or reject to what is the work done. There is also a concept of uh, a determination panel. So when the tax administration, uh, you know, when the review panel is not in a position to conclude or they fail to come to a conclusion, okay, one has to remember that, you know, this would be a group consisting of different uh, tax offices from different countries it's possible they do not come to an agreement and then the matter goes to a determination panel the determination panel again would be consisting of uh, tax authorities from different countries again they are only representative all the tax administration cannot participate okay so uh, <clears throat> that if the if the affected tax administration does not uh, agree with the allocation okay it may go to a, a determination panel and the determination panel, you know, would give its finding. And finally, the MNE, uh, you know, also has a right to disagree with what the determination panel says. And if the MNE does not agree, then it goes back to the, the domestic law taxation. So, uh, you know, a, a, a fairly detailed process uh, is contemplated. A fairly detailed, uh, you know, uh, a mechanism is uh, contemplated. 
for the assessment of the entire thing. So effectively, so far, what used to happen is that uh, you know the tax, uh, the MNE group, you know, let's say the group has uh, you know seven entities, and these seven entities may have an obligation to file tax returns in 35 countries. Now, all that may not happen. A single return will be filed in the deed tax administration. That return will be assessed, scrutinized, looked at by the uh, you know a review panel or the determination panel, and the taxes will be paid based on that. The last is implementation and administration. Four of things are required to implement this. They're contemplating three things to happen. One is amendment to the domestic law. So to, to, to give effect to all that which I said, you know, in last uh, uh, 60 minutes, uh, what is contemplated is that everything will be transposed, everything will be incorporated in the domestic law of all the countries. Domestic law has to recognize a taxing right, you know, uh, and everything is needs to be done to uh, make this country entitled to levy tax on a non-resident. Uh, domestic law should also have an, you know, a provision for giving relief for double taxation, uh, and the procedural aspect also needs to be considered in the domestic law. Uh, so, uh, you know, everything. Uh, you know, would be incorporated in the domestic law as well, which happens in the domestic law. Uh, for public international law implementation, what is contemplated is a new MLA altogether. You know, a, a completely new document or a new agreement would come in. Uh, again, there could be a single agreement, you know, signed by all the countries uh, in the inclusive framework, and which would, uh, you know, enable uh, the implementation of the entire thing. Uh, new MLA would override the bilateral tax treaties uh, you know whenever there's a there's a conflict again uh, you know there are some attempts to see whether the existing mli can be utilized for this purpose okay but it seems that it might not be possible because the feature or the flavor of the existing mli is to make amendments to the existing bilateral tax treaties whereas the new mli you know would be a completely new document which is which is dealing with a completely new taxing date so which will be worded in a completely different manner and then there will be guidance in the form of uh, you know commentary uh, you know on all this one of the important features is that this can be once this is implemented the countries will have an obligation to remove or withdraw the unilateral measures like india has done equalization levy so once this is implemented there will be an obligation to withdraw those provisions Interestingly, you know, if we if we look at the product perspective, you know, it's going to be a kind of a complete uh, hybrid uh, mechanism. Okay, you have amount A, which is uh, which is outside uh, your bilateral tax treaties, which is you know from a, a from a different uh, a kind of a taxing right, which is not based on a transfer pricing. You have amount B and amount C, which is based on transfer pricing, and which will be governed by the uh, existing laws and existing uh, bilateral tax treaties as well. So on the whole, uh, you know, uh, 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 if this gets implicated, uh, implemented, certainly there will be far more uh, uh, complications. But a very interesting times, you know, are waiting for the tax professionals if this is uh, uh, going to get implemented. Uh, there are several ifs and buts. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a larger issue of uh, the the US. Uh, uh, government agreeing or not agreeing to this. Uh, also, the reason that uh, you know we are we are nearing uh, nearing the elections in US, so it may happen that for next few months they may not want to do anything. Uh, beyond US, the 138 countries you know also need to come to a conclusion on several part of it. Uh, so there are several ifs and buts uh, you know which are there. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know it's important to you know uh, develop a basic understanding you know of what's happening out there you know otherwise what happens is that you know we just uh, you know don't understand uh, what's happening there so uh, you know with that uh, i'll i'll stop here you know this uh, this last slide of my presentation and i'll be happy to take any questions uh, which the group has uh, thank you thank you sir for this uh, highly insightful session uh, one of the participants per se, uh, you know, is requesting if you can throw uh, some more light on marketing and distribution safe harbor under, under amount A. 
Okay, so, uh, well, I mean, I don't know who raised this question, but, you know, that's a fairly, uh, you know, a, a, a detailed concept, you know, it's difficult to explain, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in this uh, uh, shorter uh, window, but in short, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a mechanism, it's a kind of a safe harbor they have, you know, thought of. Uh, to ensure that there's no double counting, you know, which happens in one of the sites, I did deal with, uh, you know, double client counting. Uh, yeah, so this slide, you know, deals with double counting. So, uh, you know, the, the marketing distribution safe harbor, you know, is fairly kind of, you know, a, a detailed one. So it's a little difficult to, you know, kind of explain, you know, in this framework. Uh, uh, you know, but I mean, there's a clear guidance which is available on that. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, sir, uh, the next question is, do you see a consensus among nations anytime soon on digital economy taxation as OECD hopes for? If so, how will it be implemented when none of the MLI articles provide for such taxation? Uh, well, so there are two questions, uh, you know, uh, within that, uh, whether uh, the inclusive framework members uh, would agree on it. As I say, there are 138 uh, uh, members uh, and there are several aspects, uh, you know, which are sensitive, uh, you know, uh, on which the countries uh, may not necessarily agree. But if we look at, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the declarations or the statements or the joint statements, uh, you know, which uh, OECD inclusive framework has been making on behalf of all this country, uh, is that, uh, you know, I mean, they, they are the intention or a commitment, you know, of the issue. So, you know, at some point of time, you know, it may be contemplated that yes, uh, you know, they would come to a, a conclusion uh, at this. Uh, how soon uh, you know that could uh, uh, really be really be a question mark, uh, especially for the you know for the reason that uh, even at the current stage, a lot more amount of work is still pending, uh, a lot more amount of uh, issues are to be discussed at a at a political level you know by the countries uh, you know and the political blessing should be there. And also, uh, you know, the contingency around, uh, you know, the U.S. elections and, you know, in the U.S. obligation, uh, objection to the entire thing, you know, right from the right beginning, uh, U.S. is not in favor of this. And last December, they said that we want to make this as a, as a uh, uh, safe harbor, you know, they wanted to make the entire uh, amount as a safe harbor. So, uh, you know, there's another kind of a contingency, uh, which is there. Uh, another question, you know, within that was, uh, what is the, uh, you know, how is it going to happen in the MLI? So just to explain it better, uh, there would be a completely new MLI. The current MLI, you know, which is already there, uh, which is addressing, uh, you know, which is addressing or rather making modifications to the existing tax treaties. Okay, what is contemplated for, for Pillar A? Is a completely new MLI and not the one which is uh, prevalent now. Okay, okay. So the last question for today is: uh, Recently, UN has come up with their own model. So how does this differ from the OECD model? So uh, you know, I would say the the major difference, you know, is that. Uh, the OECD model is uh, dealing with uh, uh, two parts. One is uh, automated digital services, and the second is uh, you know CFE, consumer facing business. The UN model proposition uh, does not have anything on uh, on uh, CFP, so you know that's that's a, that's a kind of a, a major difference. Uh, another difference is that uh, the OECD is you know has gone far more into granular details, okay, which is, uh, uh, you know, UN uh, yet to do. And that's for the reason that, you know, probably OECD is working on it for the fourth or fifth year, whereas, you know, UN in that sense has just come up, uh, you know, for the first time. So, uh, you, know, you know, what Mr. Balsan has, you know, suggested is partly adopting, uh, you know, some features uh, uh, from OECD. Uh, uh, inclusive framework uh, model as far as EDS is concerned. But the OECD, you know, is certainly going, uh, you know, into far more greater detail. Uh, UN model, you know, certainly, you know, does not contemplate 
rewriting everything possible in all across the world so basically wants to rewrite everything so all 10 blocks you know are essentially rewriting everything uh, un model you know does not uh, you know go as per that the major challenge uh, in 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 un model is that uh, you know unlike oecd there is there is no mli uh, you know in the un model so if oecd comes up with a solution you know because these 138 countries are together because they already have you know sort of an mli uh, which is signed which uh, you know may be explored uh, to implement uh, you know the the new solution uh, as against that uh, what is un doing is that un has come up with a new article very straight forward and simple article uh, that will form part of if accepted that will form part of the 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 un model okay uh, from un model to make it uh, 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 operational you know it has to form part of the real tax treaties the bilateral tax treaties so un does not have a mechanism as of now uh, to do that so that's you know that's kind of another challenge uh, which un model has okay so thank you sir thank you so much uh, for this absolutely uh, insightful session and we look forward to hosting you again thank you thank you